Good evening and welcome to beautiful downtown Grand Forks. This is Monday, May 10th, 5.30 p.m., the committee meeting for the com Committee of the Whole. Um, welcome and roll call. Weigel. Here. Dockler. Here. Weber. Mock. Here. Cavani. Here. Sandy. Veen. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, I'd actually like to make a motion to suspend the agenda to recognize um, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. I'll second that. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Um, recognition of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. This May, during Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, otherwise known as AAPI Heritage Month, we recognize the contributions and achievements of Asians, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders across our nation and within our greater Grand Forks community. It is even more important now to recognize the significance of these contributions after a year in which attacks have been at an incredible high. This annual celebration was initiated in 1978, designating the month of May for recognition. The city of Grand Forks sees and understands the importance of acknowledging AAPIs in our community that contribute to our diversity workforce and are an integral part of our community's rich fabric. While there is no single story of AAPI experience, the American story as we know it would have been impossible without the strength, dedication, and effort of those who have helped build and unite this country. Particularly today, we recognize those within the AAPI community who selflessly serve and have served on the front lines of the COVID pandemic as healthcare providers, first responders, teachers, and other essential workers. We encourage those in our community to learn more about the history of Asian Americans, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, as their history is our history, and together we are simply grand. Item two, discussion items. 2.1, application for class three on off sale beer and wine alcohol beverages license from Good Works LLC, DBA Archives Coffee House. All right, thank you. Vice President Mock and members of the committee, um, as Ms. Mock stated, what you have uh, before you is an application for class three, which is your beer, wine, alcohol beverage license from Good Works LLC, uh, and they're doing business as archives. Uh, and then this is located at 3012 University Avenue. Uh, they have submitted their application and have uh, paid that associated fee. Uh, issuance of a new license does require the review and approval of the city council, uh, also subject to approval of area city departments and as, as well as the city attorney. Uh, the application and business model summary are attached um, with your staff report, as well as a dra drawing of, of their layout. Uh, we would recommend you move this forward to city council for approval, um, but if you should have any questions, um, I'm available also. Um, we have a representative in the audience here that is uh, here if you have any questions of the applicant. Thank you. Um, questions, comments? I'll move approval. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Um, any further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Item 2.2. All right, thank you. And this is another application um, also for class three, beer, wine, um, alcohol beverage license. This one comes from the other half, Coffee and Tap House, LLC. Um, we have received the application and application fee. Uh, this business is requesting this license and uh, is located at 4571 South Washington Street. Uh, as with the last uh, item, uh, new licenses do require the review and approval of city council. Um, and is of course subject to the approval uh, and review of several city departments and the city attorney. Um, as is the case in both of these applicants, um, they have been advised to, um, if uh, they were to allow minors, um, the code does, uh, uh, we need to meet the 50% gross sales coming from food and, and uh, that is prepared on and sold on site. Um, but with this one as the last, we do recommend you move this forward to city council 
uh, for approval, which of course is subject to the review of departments and city attorney. As with the last, we do have representatives um, in the audience um, if you should have any questions. Thank you. I move um, approval. We have a motion. Is there a second? And a second from Mr. Weigel. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Item 2.3, noise variance and letter of intent for co-mingling during brick and barley Johnny Holmes band in Town Square, July 22nd, 2021. Good evening. Good evening, Vice President Mock and council members. I'm bringing forward for you a, an event that has request from brick and barley to uh, hold a concert in Town Square on July 22nd, 2021. And uh, Brick and Barley, who is the, um, the merchant who is going to be, or the alcohol vendor, will be providing co-mingling. Part of the conditions of co-mingling is they do have to have um, two, a minimum of two um, off-duty police officers, which they have, of course, always complied with. Um, again, this is in July. We'd like to see this move forward so that they could plan for their event. Thank you. Comments or questions? Move approval. We have a motion by Weigel. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Bean? I have a comment. Not <laughs> okay. Ms. Stockler, our question, question comment? actually. Um, so right now, as far as the North Dakota Public Health website, it is saying that they're not advising outdoor events, even though the outdoor events are clearly the best option at this point. This is in July, um, and so that does give us a few months out from where we are now. Um, and hopefully we continue on the trend that we're currently on for vaccinations and for getting you know to a point of this new normal back to new normal back to normal kind of a way um, but i would like to say that um, I, will, I will probably vote yes to move this forward but i would like it to be contingent on where we are as a community and our vaccination levels um, hopefully we aren't going to slide back to anywhere near where we were last year um, but just in case i do want that to be a part of this conversation um, because it isn't clear that this is something that is being suggested as being a smart step moving forward. Um, I would love to see outdoor concerts this summer. I would love to see um, just more this summer. Uh, but I also think that we do need to be cautious in moving forward. Um, I am wondering too as well, have we been working with public health to kind of set up mit mitigation um, and what are the parameters in which it would be enforced for this year that would maybe be different than it was last year? Certainly, I can give you some information on that. We actually have a brand new special events application. You can find it at grandforksgov.com backslash special events, and you can pull that up. In fact, you can actually hit, hit yes, just go through the entire app, and I believe it's uh, page four, has an entire COVID plan page where we reference not only our plans, North Dakota State's plan, the current plan, the current dashboard, as well as we ask them with the guidelines that have come from Anna Ebert from Public Health, we asked them to create their own COVID plan. And each of them have done that. Um, we have probably well over 150 events already in the book. So they, it, they are really excited about bringing it back. Most, and these are all outdoor ones. But we do have a plan for that. The, each event is screened and approved or not approved by Public Health. So up to this point, has public health been a part of that conversation, or was Always. it just? They have been since I started this 18 years ago. Council Vice President Mock, if I could respond. Yeah, Mr. Fielder. I think we're going to sh we're already shifting, and I think the key is to do the opposite of what we did last year. <clears throat> we didn't want people to gather. Now we've gotten through all the easy buttons of getting people vaccinated. And now we need to be more remote and more mm -hmm. um, engaged and, and tactical. So we we need people to gather, so we can have a instead of having testing protocols, so that we can have vaccine protocols with them. So we actually need events like this where people come together that have not been vaccinated. We give them a, a, an area of opportunity for them to get vaccinated where they're at, and so that's why we're doing things. Um, at Hugo's and other locations because we really need to be more remote and, and engage folks where they're at and uh, in areas that we didn't want people to gather. So I think the state of North Dakota is probably going to relax most of their um, their gathering things and I think probably this week or next. And so now we just need to be more engaged and meet people where they're at. So I think we need to encourage people to come together safely outdoors. But more importantly, not just give people public education, but be able to vaccinate them um, at the site. 
And so I think we'll be doing more and more of that, not only with Altru, but with our own public health staff. I'm glad to hear that there's going to be more vaccination sites. That's great, but the Johnny Holm band isn't. That's just an event separate, yes? It is. But I think the point is if we're having public events, uh, we need to go where people are. And we're people that haven't taken the opportunity in certain de demographics, and they're not going to show up at Altru or they're not going to show up at public health. We need to go where they're gathering and provide them an opportunity where they normally wouldn't. And I'm not saying we're going to be right in the midst of the concert, but just like we do with Farmer's Market and other opportunities to set up an area where, hey, I would not have gotten normally vaccinated, but I showed up for this event. And since I'm over here, I'm going to go over and get vaccinated and move forward. So we're going to be doing more and more of those types of things because without us being where people are at, some people will not move forward and get vaccinated. Mr. Kavami? No, I just want to agree. I love the idea of, of being smart about what we're doing. And I feel like if there is a trend where our outbreaks go up, I feel like the state or, or we would step in and say, hey, there's something that we, that we need to do and adjust that. Um, I don't like holding events um, you know, hostage to vaccination rates just because we can't control that, they can't control that. I want people to come into our town and be excited and get downtown and, and go and spend money. Um, so I, I agree that we need to, to continue to push, but I, I don't want to have this event be contingent on something that they have n no control over, and currently we don't have any restrictions from that. Um, and I do think if, if it does get worse, we would implement restrictions. Is that something um, that staff, Mr. Phelan, or maybe public health will be doing as well as monitoring e Each status? event is monitored by them, and okay. they approve or disapprove. And actually, I should probably show you the database one of these days and show you exactly the plan of how it goes through. But every okay. single one has, has a touch from public health. So if there were an outbreak, they would be able to react and we would be By an cognizant of that um, since this is a few months out. Yep, okay. you're correct. We've got to manage it day to day. Hopefully, um, that's a pretty bad scenario two months right. from now that we have an outbreak. Because um, if we have it here, we're going to have other issues in our country. But again, just so you know, like Cheryl has said, public health is part of the review process. And ultimately, a lot of these decisions come from you know the city administration with advice um, regarding any event. So whether it's at the Alaris Center or other events. But we are, we are planning to host full tilt events at the Alaris Center this fall. And so we are migrating to that you know, start, probably starting in July. And leading into September and October, we're going to have large events, um, mm -hmm. barring something unforeseen happening. What, what's all pray that it doesn't happen. And at this point, it's outdoor events are generally the best choice. The best choice, as long as maybe people have some space to distance. Correct. And I think we're trying to get people to uh, understand that to be vaccinated means you can go outdoors, you can you can come together. Otherwise, I think we're going to defeat the purpose of why um, people get vaccinated. You get, you get vaccinated so you have freedom, so you can be safer, uh, so you can gather. And I think without that, um, we're going to struggle getting people past the 50% that this provides an opportunity for you to do these sorts of things. And then further, that's why we were saying trying to hold events that are associated with these opportunities to capture people, just like we did on Thursday at the Empire. Um, partnering with Altru where they vaccinated over 100 people that went over the Empire because they were at a, a local establishment, whether it was a coffee shop or a bar, and they went over and got vaccinated. So we're going to be doing more and more of those opportunities for people to get vaccinated that normally would not have gotten vaccinated on a Thursday evening. Uh, Mr. Weigel. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I believe there is an event that um, Ms. Horak and her staff were going to hold last year when some of this COVID stuff started popping up. And I believe you canceled that event, correct? Um, I'm not as worried. I, I've got a lot of faith in Ms. Horak and her, her staff that if something were to happen, they'd take uh, reasonable measures. And I think they've got a track record of already doing that. So um, with that, I'll, I'm ready to vote. Any further comments? I think we had a motion and a second. Oh, Ms. Uh Oh, Mr. Weber, of course. Yeah, thank you, Vice President Mock. Uh, very quickly, I, I don't believe Ms. Dockler mentioned anything about vaccination rates. So I think she was concerned about infection rates, if there was a, a surge there. But uh, I'm not seeing it in the staff report. Is it, our, is it our intention, then, as a city, to set up uh, vaccination booths at, uh, 
at events like of this sort? And what, what's the policy there? Council Vice President Mock, yeah. Council Member Weber. I think uh, we don't, we've removed to a remote op operation at the Hugo's on 32nd and we're gonna to plan to have more and more of these pop-up events. And so I'm not gonna say specifically we're gonna be at all of these, but we need to be where the people are right now because people aren't coming to us anymore. So we need to do the opposite of which going to them. So I could see that doing this more and more at events where people are. And I think not only is Grand Forks doing that, um, a lot of towns USA are doing that. So we're just following the national trend of what people are doing. So you are, okay. Mr. Phelan, you are actually thinking of having like public health or all true maybe come to some of these yep. types of events, whether it's this one or not. Yep. Just like we partnered on testing vaccinations at Alara Center, now we need to start partnering up in harder to reach populations and, and where people have, for whatever reason, have um, chosen not to be vaccinated. Um, if I may, Ms. Uh, Vice President Mark. Yes. Um, like Ms. Dockler, I, I'm inclined to support this. I plan on voting uh, in, in favor. Uh, the concerns that she brought up were not, a, if I heard correctly, were not about vaccination rates, although I'd, I agree with uh, uh, Representative Cromley that we should not be tying decisions to uh, uh, vaccination rates. The, uh, the, the vendor, uh, Ms. Horak, they have no control over that. Um, and I love the idea, Mr. Phelan, of uh, more pop-up events, but I'm not seeing that here. So I, I think these things were maybe outside of the concerns that Ms. Doppler raised. Uh, I, I support the, the concerns that she raised. I'm happy that we've had the discussion and I'm, I'm ready to vote. Any further comments? No. Oh, Just Dean. very quickly, I think for, for Mr. Phelan, I, I'm appreciative of the creativity you're having in trying to get different locations and getting out to the people because we have to do that. The concern I would have is hopefully we can get that second, if there's two shots, we get the second shot too and not just the first shot. Council Vice President Mock and Council Member Vien, yep, obviously the Johnson & Johnson would be the best. And I think that's what they were offering at the Empire, Johnson & Johnson or Pfizer. Some people, for whatever reason, don't want the Johnson & Johnson. So, you know, the Pfizer was, I think, the other choice. And obviously it comes with a commitment whether you show up or not for the second appointment. But again, I, I think we need to be more adaptive and um, not everybody agreed with centralization when you really, this, the role out of the national government was to decentralize. We centralized here, we were really effective. Now what we're saying, we need to decentralize and, and so that we're, that's what we're gonna do between now and hopefully September. All right, seeing no more questions. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Item 2.4, amendments to CDBG annual action plans. Good evening. Thank you, Ms. Mock. Um, as you can imagine, the COVID pandemic has had a negative impact on several of our CDBG funded projects, as well as making it difficult for the city to meet HUD's timely expenditure requirements. So we have worked with some of the affected agencies and have some requested changes to our annual action plans. These projects fall over um, 2019, 2020, and 2021 annual action plans, but we're trying to just kind of bring them to you in a common sense approach to how to move forward now. So um, as, as outlined in your staff report, we have them kind of organized into three projects, even though it, it really is kind of two agencies with five separate projects here listed. Um, the first one involves canceling the Ruth Myers project, which was a 2019 project, and reallocating those funds to the Faith and Hope um, renovation project, which was awarded funds in 2020. Um, both of these awards were to the Grand Forks Housing Authority, and the Housing Authority has requested this transfer as well. Um, the Ruth Myers project was um, initially meant to be kind of a collaborative project involving the school district in Northeast. That project hit um, several snags, and um, at this point, the Housing Authority hopes that the project will still move forward, but it would probably be next year at the soonest. Um, their faith and hope renovation project just had a bid opening a few weeks ago and, and came in significantly over budget. So their request is to move the funds from the Ruth Myers project to the Faith and Hope project, which would allow um, that project to proceed this year. Um, the second item on your staff report involves um, Red River Valley Community Action Agency. 
Um, the request is to transfer 91000 from the Home Sense um, Housing Rehab Revolving Loan Fund to Red River for um, rehab of their recently acquired new um, facility. They just bought the former PS Doors facility on Gateway Drive. And since the Home Sense Housing Rehab Program was basically shut down for most of 2020 and wasn't spending any money, um, they have requested that we transfer you know, just a, a one-time transfer of, of 91000 from the revolving loan fund to them to make some improvements, um, primarily security and energy efficiency improvements to their new facility, again, with the idea that that, that could get done and, and the money expended this year. And then um, the last one is just there was a, a $10,000 operating grant made to the Ernie Norman shelter. That shelter was closed due to COVID, and so we just need to cancel that project. Um, what we're asking tonight is, is your feedback on this. If you agree that these are appropriate changes, then we will um, hold a public hearing on June 7th. And, and if, if you approve it at that time, then we'd submit all these required amendments to HUD concurrently. So with that, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the council? Move approval. Motion by Weber. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Item 2.5, award bid for project number 8356, flood damage repair at Shady Ridge Court. Good evening. Good evening, Vice President Mock, members of City Council. Uh, a little bit of background on this thing really quick. Uh, Shady Ridge, if you remember, that's one of the roads uh, out there that, that goes underwater uh, during some of our high, high flood events. Uh, well, what we have done in the past is when that road gets damaged, we usually qualify for some sort of federal funds to repair and sometimes to mitigate in that. Over the years, we've added some culverts and we've done some other, uh, basically, ar we call it armoring of the, of the, of the roadway. So when the, when the river goes over the top of it, it doesn't wash it away. That's been pretty successful. And we've been using federal funds for that, again, uh, to expand that and armor it and make it beefier every, kind of every flood. So in 2020, we, we did uh, have a flood here that, that ran through there. And, and again, the armoring held very, very well. There's some minor repairs that needed to be done. We applied for federal dollars, FEMA dollars to do that. So we've uh, got dollars for the repair. They also had some money to do additional mitigation efforts out there. The estimate that we had uh, to do the, the mitigation effort was, I'll just say the mid, mid $50,000 range. Uh, I'm very happy to say when we took bids out here that, that the low bidder uh, Tager contracting is at 39,000 and change. So we, we got an extremely good bid on this thing. Uh, however, the, the federal, the, the additional good news is that the, uh, we've already actually received the federal dollars to do this mitigation work. Uh, I think the federal dollars is $53,584. So, Coupling with my story ahead of this about continuing to armor this stretch, what we would like to do uh, is, is award the contract to the low bidder, uh, Tony An uh, Tager uh, Contracting, uh, in the amount of $39,732. But I would also like to include in that giving the city engineer a change order authority to fully expend those federal dollars, which means we'll be able to go out there and do some more work, some more armoring on that stretch, and again, make it make it beefier and tough, tougher uh, over time. And that's what we've been doing. So that, that would be my recommendation. That's a slight change to the uh, original recommendation. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Move approval. Uh, oh, we have a motion by Weigel. Is there a second? I'll second it with, the, okay. uh, with uh, granting the authority for the changes. Any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item 2.6, bid award 2021-12 landfill refuse compactor with trade-in equipment. Good evening. Good morning, Vice President Mock, uh, members of the council. Uh, we would like to award the bidder to Titan Machinery here in Grand Forks as they were the lowest and best bid for a new compactor for our inert landfill that will replace our 2016 model that is coming up due uh, for service life. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Motions? Motion by Weigel. Is there a second? Second. Um, seeing no further comments, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. 
Item 2.7, bid award 2021-14, front loader refuse truck with trade-in equipment. Yes, that is correct. Um, so this here will actually be for a trade-in, uh, a previous model of 2011 Peterbilt will be trade-in for a 2020 model. Um, and this will also be uh, used front load refuse for all our commercial routes, uh, things like that. So we're looking to award the bid to uh, sanitation products as they were the lowest and best bid. Thank you. Um, comments? Motion? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. And a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Item 2.8, wastewater treatment facility plan project number 8199. Good evening. Council Vice President Mock, I want to uh, recognize Nicholas Blackwell, who works in our public works. You didn't introduce him, but you haven't probably seen him, but he works in public works in the administrative side, so he's been uh, doing a nice job along with uh, the street and sanitation crew, especially with Lee Ray having retired. So with that, uh, Sean Gaddy and I are gonna, uh, we, we provided an overview had some good conversations and an article over the over the weekend on this. So we're going to um, go over uh, uh, the slides a few more times. Also, I want to recognize Scott Schaefer is available via um, via vir virtual. Also, one thing we talked about, and, and this got a lot of highlight. Uh, Mr. Weber and and I had a conversation about why do we have a wastewater treatment plant? We have a wastewater treatment plant because of residential, commercial, and industrial. And and you should know that we um, we're in the northern. Red River Valley, we're very dependent on agriculture, and uh, thankfully Grand Forks has a wastewater treatment system that can that can accept agribusiness in our town, and our wastewater treatment plant is a is a key component part of our our industrial um, what we do. I just want to point out the wastewater treatment plant is down below here, and you can see this, this is 1,300 acres of lagoon, and you can see what a small footprint a wastewater treatment plant can do to treat uh, wastewater, and so that's what we've been doing um, over the last. Uh, several years it tells you about what that can do um, what we did is uh, Sean's gonna go over some more details but again a little bit different than a water plant there's a little more sophistication with the wastewater treatment plant it's all about hydraulic capacity and loading capacity and most of what we're looking at expanding right now is due to loading capacity and that's the strength of the, of the wastewater not so much the hydraulic load or the flow that's going through the plant it's more that strength uh, of the wastewater. That's really more what we're doing to not only renew but add capacity to our wastewater treatment plant. And Sean will go over a little of that more deep. So here's our existing, we talked about uh, our wastewater treatment plant uh, with a number of people that we're serving. When we first started out this master plan, you know, when I showed you the timeline back in 20 or 1995, that's 25 years ago, we were probably less than uh, 49,000 or so. And now you can see we're up to 64,000 people that we're serving which includes East Grand Forks. And you can see we have more significant permits than we did you know, 25 years ago. What we asked for as part of this is just not add capacity to our plant, but take another run with working with the North Dakota Department of Environmental Quality of trying to re-rate our plant so that we could add um, hydraulic capacity to our plant and we could also add loading capacity to our plant. When these things are designed, they're designed to certain limits. So we, as part of this, um, it was also to, to look at this existing plant to try to re-rate it at a higher capacity before we looked at trying to add more uh, capacity to it. So here's kind of where we're at. Sean's going to talk a little bit about these four reactors. This plant was set up to add more reactors as we needed more uh, capacity. So if you would have looked at a master plan from the 1990s or early 2000s, we would have added um, two more reactors here. And so what we're doing here that's different than what was ever envisioned as part of the design of this plant is we're going to try to reuse those four reactors and add more capacity instead of just adding two more of, of, of things. So that's, that's changed over time. Again, this is our timeline. We're 25 years later, I guess 26 years later. Um, this is really highlighted by that. We did start this plant up in the 2000s. It wasn't very simple and straightforward. There was a lot of uh, ups and downs, ins and outs, but the point is uh, we've resolved it through the 2000s. Um, and in really the second half of the decade was a much better uh, 10 years than it was the first 10 years of trying to get this plant up and going. So really the second half, really, it really, this plant really proved to be a good asset to the city is the fact that I highlighted uh, J.R. Simplot went from an aerobic pretreatment system to an anaerobic pretreatment system. We had capacity to so that they could move forward with that. Highlighted by East Grand Forks interconnecting and then finally with Red River Biorefinery 
that connected um, as part of that. All along the way, we had population growth. So I want to highlight it wasn't just industrial growth. I want to highlight there was commercial growth, obviously, in our community over those last several or two decades, but there was also residential growth. Um, the facility was uh, this facility plan not only was to look at uh, existing capacities and how we could push them a little bit further, but try to um, move forward with the existing site and how to make it more efficient and effective. And so really that's what we've hired AE2S to do is to look at how we can really maximize the facility and how best to add further capacity. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean. He's going to go over some. And then at the very end, there was questions on you know budget and impacts. I'll go over some slides and what we're looking at as part of funding too. Thanks, Todd. Um, good evening, Vice President Mock, members of the council. Uh, as Todd mentioned, I'm Sean Gaddy. I'm with AE2S here in Grand Forks. I do also have one of my colleagues, Scott Schaefer, who is our wastewater practice leader uh, from our, our company, who is on the phone as well uh, in support if there's any more detailed questions that uh, maybe my wastewater knowledge can't dive quite that deep into. So um, as Todd mentioned, uh, we've been looking closely and, and, and have a number of things related to facility deficiencies and challenges. And on the next few slides, I'm just going to hit on a few of the things that you see in green here from the, the code requirements and limitations, some of the complexity uh, of the wastewater plant, um, some of the complexity of the loading of the plant, both from domestic and industrial sources, as Todd mentioned, some of the things that are missing in terms of current long-term solids management strategies, as, as well as backup power generation at the plant, and then in consideration of, of uh, planning for a facility that uh, we're looking out over the next 20 years, also looking at anticipated future regulations and how we might address those at the time that they, uh, they do become a reality. Uh, from a flexibility standpoint, um, this plant, and Todd kind of hit on this last week, but under normal domestic loading circumstance, you would generally expect to see wastewater in the bottles that are shown here, more of that yellowed type of look uh, when you look at the coloring of the water. On any given day, um, just depending upon what's going on with uh, business and industry in the community, the plant does see pretty large fluctuations in what that influent flow and strength characteristics look like. You can see here that the bottle that's generally more pink, pink or orange in nature, uh, what's happening there is some pretty complex strength that the plant has to have the ability to, to handle. And that strength is both as a form of, of oxygen demand through um, what's called the BOD loading that Todd highlighted a moment ago, as well as nutrient loading. Both of those things can, can contribute to what you see here in terms of color shifts in the wastewater. So it's not just the color that's the problem, it's what's causing that color. Uh, that we're having to deal with and create that flexibility uh, to remove. The plant itself in its original design, as Todd mentioned, and as he showed on the, uh, the aerial photograph just a moment ago, you have the four bioreactors and in between those bioreactors you have that, that square in the middle which is essentially um, the distribution building is the name of that. And the bioreactors as they work right now is what's called, they work in series. And so wastewater comes in and it has to, to traverse in and out of each one of those bioreactors. And then from a flexibility standpoint or when loadings are high, the ability to recycle that water back through that series is needed in the process. So you can see here that you have this little blue interconnect arrow and the ability to recycle gives you the ability to remove more nutrients, take that wastewater through those reactors you know, uh, in, in an extra routing, in essence, to knock down that strength that uh, you're, you're looking to uh, remove from the wastewater before discharging in order to meet your discharge permit regulations. A huge inefficiency right now in how these operate in series. One, that ability to uh, recycle that wastewater through, that's, that's very hydraulically limited. Uh, we don't have the capacity when we really get those high load fluctuations to, to send that water back over the wall, back through these in series again to deal with it. And then as they're in series, you also get different hydraulic complexities related to you have different water levels that end up occurring between all four as that water makes its way through, which creates inefficient oxygen delivery uh, to each of the reactors. So what we're really looking to do um, with this is improve some of these complexities and inefficiencies that you see in the way those reactors are set up today. Um, as Todd mentioned to you uh, just a moment ago, the plant itself, um, overall, hydraulically, what we can take through the plant, as well as what we have in the capacity of those 1,300 acres of lagoons, there's, there's a decent amount of, of hydraulic or flow capacity 
that currently exists. Now how we handle that flow, as I just mentioned, and the ability to recycle it, that is a hydraulic limitation, but overall the amount of water we can take to the plant, wastewater we can take to the plant on any given day, is generally sufficient. More so, it's our ability, again, to recycle that water, to knock out the strength is where we're currently limited. And so you can see on the biochemical oxygen demand, the BOD, so essentially the, 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 the strength that's being contributed to the plant, overall, we're, we're very limited as the plant exists today. Um, from a solids handling, so that's all the solids both come in the form, or this is total suspended solids. And so those solids are essentially removed and we have generally sufficient capacity today, but we're nearing a limit on our ability to handle those solids to the plant. And then the last TKN, that's the nitrient, nitrogen or nutrient loading to the facility. We're, we're very limited on the loading capacity that we have available to handle that today. So really looking in, in these improvements to handle each of these three areas, but really emphasizing our ability to, to meet the BOD and D TKN demands currently being seen and that we anticipate to see uh, over the next 20 years. So as we consider those next 20 years, um, there were some questions last week about the capacity and generally what is the capacity being provided for. Um, what this graphic is representing is our 20 year growth projection uh, based on the capacity needs of, of the Grand Forks, East Grand Forks, the industrial users in orange that exist today. And then there's an, an additional bar there that you see jutting up around the 2031 time frame for what we're calling reserve capacity requirements. In the initial facility improvements that we'll highlight in just a moment, what those highlight is essentially expanding the capacity to meet what I'll call as a more moderate growth demand. So generally 0.9% per year population growth and maintaining with a little bit of extra capacity enough, um, enough there for industry that exists today. What the green is representing here and what we're calling reserve capacity is the ability should something unforeseen, whether it's larger than expected population growth and or a large economic development opportunity materializes the ability to, to, to chunk on that capacity quickly. And that was a key consideration in our planning is having that ability to bring on something quickly should it be needed um, in the event of, like I said, unforeseen growth or, or additional industry. This graphic is really representing the same thing, but more so getting at how are we providing that from a strength standpoint. The prior graphic was flow, this is loading. And you always have to consider both um, as, as we've been describing here throughout the process or throughout the presentation here. So uh, this is giving ourselves the ability to essentially chunk on an additional 13,000 pounds after what we're considering in our, our baseline or more moderate growth, a growth of about 50,000 pounds per day of oxygen delivery ability with the facility, uh, getting that to 70,000 with the ability to increase it quickly should, be need, should it be needed. A few of the other things that we're looking to address um, are some of the code and safety requirements. Wastewater, uh, essentially that wastewater makes its way to the plant and it's released to open air in what's called the headworks building. What you have is the potential for there to be hydrogen sulfide gas releases and that hydrogen sulfide gas can be corrosive, it can be explosive, um, corrosive meaning it can eat concrete, explosive meaning that if a match or cigarette were to be lit in the area it could explode and then just generally is dangerous to human health if it's at a high enough concentration in the air. In, that, uh, in the facility that exists today, there, there are large air handling units that remove that gas from that enclosed headworks facility. One of the key improvements we're looking at here is upgrading um, all of those air handling units in order to make sure that they're, they're there and work properly for the next 20 years. Um, in addition to that, the facility itself originally had some design and maintenance deficiencies, design and maintenance access deficiencies that we're looking to, uh, looking to improve. Um, what we're showing here in pictures is what I would consider to be inadequate or unsafe maintenance access through the use of ship ladders and, and generally your standard run-of-the-mill extension ladders where platforms and regular staircases would be typically what you would want to see from a safety standpoint. And then there's things like motors, if you can see here on the right hand that picture, that motor is suspended about, if I remember right, that one's about 40 feet in the air where there's absolutely no way to get at it. And so. In that case, you're looking at pretty unique, uh, unique requirements for the operators out there to, to be able to, 
to rig themselves up to have the ability to maintain motors in those those conditions. There's there's many other examples like this, but we just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of uh, items that we had pictures that I think were worth uh, worth the amount of words to describe what uh, is happening. Now, lastly, as I mentioned, regulations. Um, the biggest thing that's been talked about from a regulatory standpoint over the past decade is potential for, for new nutrient regulations and having to reduce the nutrient strength in the wastewater discharge far below what we currently have the ability to do with the plant that exists today. So one of the key things we're planning for is the ability in any of the alternatives considered is, is to have that nutrient removal capacity when slash if those, those nutrients become a reality in the next 10 to 20 years. So from an improvement standpoint, um, we did work, the consulting team and the city staff team that, that reviewed all of the different alternatives. We screened initially over a dozen alternatives, ultimately paring it down to three primary alternatives that we analyzed for consideration. The, the alternative that we are recommending is what's called the retrofit of bioreactors into biological nutrient removal and dewatering of the, the dewatering air drying of the solids. And we'll get into a little bit what we mean by that in just a moment here. We did take each of those three alternatives through what's called a kepner trego decision scoring analysis. Um, we've done this type of scoring analysis with the city in the past. This was actually used to, to come to the preferred alternative for what ultimately became the new, new potable water treatment plant. Um, as we look at this, it considers many different factors from the standpoint of stakeholder interest, cost, operation and maintenance considerations, and there's multiple, multiple questions that we run through to screen the scoring, ultimately to determine which one bears out the best. And what I would generally say is all, all of these alternatives generally scored relatively well um, from an O&M and stakeholder slash public interest standpoint. When we say that related to wastewater, really you're talking about other odor concerns or other offsite concerns that you might be looking at from a stakeholder public standpoint. But the biggest thing that uh, ultimately drove alternative two, you can see here in the scoring in the green, it had the highest benefit related to cost. It was far more um, cost, far less cost prohibitive than the other two alternatives considered. So that was really the driving factor in the scoring between the alternatives we looked at that, that led to this, uh, this recommendation. The key feature um, of alternative two is eliminating that complexity in the operation of the bioreactors. There's some modifications that I'll show in just a moment that allow us to do that. But in essence, what we're talking about is having these bioreactors operate independently. So bringing, having the ability to bring flow independently in and out of each one of these instead of them all having to operate together. So taking them out of series and putting them into parallel operation, which would give us the ability to load them differently, um, uh, manage the hydraulics better, as I mentioned, recycle within, which I'll get to in just a moment. All of those items give us far more flexibility um, when the facility does see daily changes in flow and loading, and as we look out over the horizon to the increase overall flow and loading to the facility. So what's giving us the ability to do that versus what Todd described as just adding more reactors is actually building these bullseye walls into uh, each one of those reactors where we can then cycle the water amongst those concentric rings you see there in order to do, in essence, the same thing within each that we were doing interdependently with all four reactors. So they'll all essentially do the same thing by themselves now that they had to do across all four reactors prior is essentially what this is showing. In order to do that, there's a lot of piping modifications between the reactors uh, that has to occur in order, in order for us to, to operate, hydraulic, or operate the plant hydraulically this way. We're planning to do all these improvements in phases. And so the phases you see here are, are getting the, the piping in place. Um, one of the, the, the items in phase one is, is redistribution or managing some of the solids that we've already accumulated within uh, the existing um, wastewater pond cells. Uh, that gives us the ability to really push out phase three that we have shown here to address phase one and two. And so you'll see in a moment here we show phase three as a pending need because one of the items we're talking about in phase one is addressing those solids and giving us some, I'll call it interim capacity 
to manage them before a more robust solution has to be put in place. And then phase two, as I described, was the, the, the bioreactor modifications themselves, building those walls. Uh, and phase four is from a flexibility standpoint. It says if necessary. But phase four is really giving us the ability um, through what's called integrated fixed film activated sludge process to modify those bioreactors quickly in the event that a large new capacity demand comes on above and beyond those growth curves that I showed um, just a moment ago. Oh, got a, looks like we've got a little bit of a, an issue with Excel, uh, an Excel graphic here. Um, so th this is those phases, uh, as I just represented, shown in a time frame that we're proposing or, or recommending for implementation. Phase one, rack my brain what the, the dollar value was, I believe it was 14 and a half million for phase one, where it says cell range there in the time, sorry, 13.7 million. Um, 13.7 million it, it, implementing those yard process piping improvements, general facility improvements, um, getting that in place, which really gives us the ability to proceed to phase two. Uh, the key point here in phase two at 31.3 million, you'll see a rather extended time frame for construction. In order to accomplish phase two, we can't take all four existing reactors out of service. We have to do them consecutively. So one one year, one another year, so on. And a key, a key thing to getting that done before we see any other additional capacity demands is, is doing that sooner rather than later. And why we're calling it a critical need. Because if you don't get out ahead of, of, of any demands on the plant, we may not have the ability to do this strategy long term. Um, just given how we have to take some of the plant out of service. Uh, phase three is that, that long-term biosolids management. As I mentioned, some of the work in phase one is allowing us to create, turn that into a pending need instead of a critical need. And then that phase four is the IFAS improvements. Um, phase three was a, just to, for clarification here in the yellow, was a $23.6 million improvement project. And then phase four is a $7.8 million improvement project. Key thing I would highlight on phase four is it could be done consecutively with phase one and phase two. So if something came along while we were making the, the improvements to phase or to the bioreactors, we could be implementing the phase four improvements at the same time if we were in a circumstance where a new industry came to our door you know, tomorrow asking for that capacity today. So that really is an if necessary with a lot of flexibility um, brought to the table in, in how we're configuring. Um, last item here is we are showing, and Todd will hit on this in a moment, uh, in last year's uh, six-year CIP with the 2021 budget process, we did propose about $31.2 million in total treatment improvements. Really what this facility plan um, was doing through our work here over the last year was really refining how all of that was to be Implement, implemented, um, staged, phased, et cetera, and identifying really the long-term needs to, get, to meet the, the 2020 year, the 20 year um, requirements of the wastewater treatment plant. I kind of hit on this, um, 40, this is phase one and two in combination, um, $45 million in improvements to get those, uh, those uh, improvements in place over the next five, five to six years. Uh, generally saying the same thing I mentioned earlier, so I'll move on from that quickly. Um, the biosolids in phase three, uh, really what we're proposing here is the ability to mechanically dewater solids. The strategy right now, there's a graph, or the, the image here on the bottom right hand of the slide. What that's showing is how we currently manage the solids generated by the facility is by disposing them uh, interim, on an interim basis into one of the lagoon cells. And that lagoon cell essentially is filling up with those solids. We're planning to manage them in place, redistribute them. That's what phase one and two would do. But long term, uh, we will only be able to do that for so long. And so this mechanical facility would give us the ability to not basically send them out into a pond for long term management. Give us the ability to actually just take the water out of them, create it more of what would become like a soil like material that could be discharged in landfill, land applied, uh, et cetera. So, it's that long-term strategy and how we mechanically handle those solids once we do run out of the capacity to do what we're, we're doing today. And then phase four, that fancy acronym IFAS, 
really what that is is once we improve those bioreactors, we would place what are our large cassettes or cartridges that would float within the bioreactors. And what that does is it gives you the ability to maintain more biology. Um, essentially, our waste, wastewater treatment uh, in the way that the plant works today occurs is you grow a bunch of bugs that eat the strength out of the wastewater. And these create a fixed environment for those bugs to really attach to and multiply so you don't blow them through the process as water is flowing through. So placing these, these cartridges into the bioreactors gives us the ability to really ramp up that capacity quickly, as we mentioned, um, should the need arise. And so kind of a neat solution to, to how it could work with what's in place today and, and get, you, get you something extra quite quickly. That I'll hand it back to Todd to talk a little bit about next steps. Thank you, Sean. Um, we mentioned last week that uh, we are um, paying off some debt service. Um, 31.3 comes off um, new, this fall, and then a remaining 4.3 comes off in 2025. So almost $36 million of debt service will come off. In the meantime, we've added a, a lot of users um, in the residential, commercial, and in the industrial. And so we've got a larger customer class now to spread uh, further costs out as we move forward. Um, again, one of the questions came out, kind of where do we fit? Grand Forks is generally in the midpoint of uh, similar sized cities um, per uh, survey. And so we're, we're still in the midpoint, about $33 per month for those u average users that are using 6,000 gallons of, of water. So in Grand Forks, you get charged a base fee and then you get charged a per thousand fee up, up to 10,000. So we're using a user of um, $33. What may this look like over the next 10 year horizon? Basically, what we took is we're looking at about a 3% increase for residential users. So in 2030, instead of paying $33 a month, you're going to be at $45 a month. And we, what we also did is aid to us does a survey, regional survey. And uh, this probably shouldn't be surprising to any of us. We're not the only ones looking at wastewater improvements. Um, and so there's other communities. And generally, what, what they have found is uh, wastewater improvements have, um, with other regional users, have gone more than 3%, so we just took their 4.6. So you can see, plus or minus, we're still going to maintain our position in and around the midpoint of our, our where rates are, um, even with this rate increase. This is what we showed you last year when we were looking at, at budgets. And so last week we thought there were going to be cost of uh, living increases. We will finalize this um, with new information that we have as part of the 22 budget and beyond. But if uh, last year when we talked at the, about the mayor's uh, 21 budget, we were looking at 3%, uh, two to 3% increases for residential. And we were looking at probably three to 4% on commercial and industrial. So you can see where the two, two we'll update this. And so I would suspect what you're gonna see in this, uh, in the 20, in the 22 budget is three to 4% increases depending on where we are re regarding residential commercial and industrial. So we'll refine that and present that as part of the mayor's budget. Where are we looking at funds? Um, the uh, state of North Dakota, just like the city of Grand Forks, are going to receive uh, significant stimulus funds and, and they're going to on, on the order of a billion dollars. And so they haven't made final det determinations and out of this one billion, that's where uh, we are also hoping to receive underpass money on 42nd and Demers. And uh, I think along, along with uh, transportation projects, they're also going to look at water and wastewater projects. So if you look at some of the other cities um, that are compar comparably low, a lot of cities use their sales tax to um, pay down some rate increases in water and wastewater. We don't do that in wastewater right now. Right now. Any project that moves forward, uh, we use um, rate impacts. So on the water side, we have used sales tax uh, for the water treatment plant. Most of our sales tax goes to transportation when we talk about infrastructure. But I think um, what the state has come to realize, um, they spend a lot of time talking about transportation projects and they talk a lot about potable water um, projects, but there's also this other component of wastewater. So hopefully they create some programs where we can seek some grant funding for projects, even in Grand Forks with our wastewater treatment plant. There's gonna be some further stimulus um, we, we anticipate from the federal government in general, the federal government, uh, when they talk about infrastructure, we'll call hard infrastructure. That means transportation, water, and wastewater infrastructure. So hopefully there's some programs we can participate in that also. 
Finally, on the, on the loan programming, so whatever we can uh, receive in, in grants is great, but the, and the next best button is uh, long, long interest or long-term low interest loans. And one thing the state legislature did, and we should be very um, positive about this, is that right now we're at $15 million for, uh, we'll call it state infrastructure revolving loan funds. Those are loans through the Bank of North Dakota. We're at our max of 15 million. So when we talk about the strategic infra infrastructure growth areas in our community, we've used $15 million worth of those to open up areas in and around the city for primary sector growth. They did, the state of North Dakota did move that from 15 to 40. And so we have a new increment that we can work off of, whether it's at the wastewater treatment plant or other projects. Generally, these loan uh, funds are for water, wastewater, and transportation projects. These loans work best for us in the um, water and wastewater because we have a repayment structure that fits a long term with rates. And so we'll probably look at that as our, our plan two, plan one. Plan two would be a state revolving loan fund um, program. And that's what we use for the, um, our share of the drinking water uh, through the drinking water SRF program with the, with the water treatment plan. The one downside is there is a federal requirements both on the American Iron and Steel and also Davis Bacon wages. I don't think the wages are a big deal, but probably the iron does add some costs. So we, our plan A would be use the Bank of North Dakota loans because they have less strings attached that our federal government adds. And then finally on the revenue bonds, as, as Maureen has talked about, we're, we're really competitive. And I think even if you look at a 20 year bond, I think the last time we sold one and those are more general um, infrastructure related to special assessments. I think we're at 1.81%. So uh, we'll see right now in this low interest rate environment what looks best between the, the Bank of North Dakota loan program, I think is gonna be best, especially when we look at 30 years. The drinking um, water program is, we're gonna have to evaluate with the federal strengths versus a revenue bond. So we'll, we'll look at all, all three of those. So what we're asking for tonight is that you approve the facility plan we submit it to the North Dakota Department of uh, Environmental Quality. They take a review of it, they approve it, and, and we'll bring that back and work through this year's budget on some of the rate impacts. We anticipate getting a, a approval of that plan from the state of North Dakota later this year, and then we'll start moving forward with some of these early out things. And so this prop plan, as it goes right, will be with us for the next 10 years, and we'll be continuing to work on this year to year and project to project with that. So with that, we're here for any questions um, that you may have regarding moving forward with the plan. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions? Ooh, a couple of questions. Mr. Todd, um, I think one of the, the basic questions I guess I have, and I think I know the answer, but are the lagoons being used at all anymore? Are they used for finishing the water? I mean, at one time, all wastewater was handled by the lagoons. Then we went to the mechanical plant. Now do we have a combination of both uh, happening? Yes, Council um, Vice President Mock and Council Member Bean. Uh, the answer is yes, we use both right now. Um, before we went to it, if, if you recall a few years ago, we started up a direct discharge so we can go from our mechanical treatment plant through, uh, through disinfection to the, our pipeline and to the river. Right. Uh, we didn't have that before then because the lagoons prior to three years ago, after this plant was finished, the lagoons were the finishing. So mother nature, sunlight, disinfected the uh, wastewater, and then we discharged it. Now we have two options. We can use the lagoons or we can use um, the direct discharge. And so, um, for example, uh, when Red River Biorefiner was first starting up um, last March, and their, their wastewater was uh, quite high, we had to use the lagoons, otherwise it would have done a number on our wastewater treatment plant. Um, but since then, and we had all the odors last summer that we don't have this year, it's because we've been taking most of that um, wastewater through our, our treatment plant and then being able to direct, direct discharge it without having to go to the, the lagoons. Right now, lagoons are a, provide a buffer for us right now, but I think our, our plan probably over the next 10 years is to reduce the scope of those lagoons probably by about a third, but still have them for um, you know large rain events, um, times when our plant gets upset and that sort of thing. So there's, they still per serve a critical uh, treatment process for us. At, at one time, I know we were looking at decommissioning them, were we not? But all of them are still remained and somewhat utilized differently? Yes, we use, um, uh, we're, we're, I'm going to say treating solids in the one 
lagoon, which is saving us to have to create a more of a mechanical system with air drying and that sort of thing. So we are still using those lagoons. If you look at our lagoon setup, when I when I say we shut um, down some of these lagoons, it's um, I'll get here in a second here. The, when I talk about a third, our plan would be to take these third that are closest to the airport and we would decommission those and likely remain with this footprint right here. Okay. For example, we talk about that one large rain event where Vail Circle, if we didn't have lagoons at that time, um, we would have been discharging a lot to the river trying to avoid people's basements. So there comes a time when you have these huge rainfall events that uh, you, we need some sort of surplus capacity at a moment of truth. Well, I think that makes it kind of unique that we have both of those available where many would just have a mechanical plant yeah. and having to deal with this. Um, I find it interesting that we're going to independent reactors versus what appeared to be a, a series. It's a significant, I mean, change. I don't understand the engineering. Why wouldn't we have done independent to begin with? There's uh, Council Vice President Mock and Council Member v and there's a lot of questions we could ask from where we got here today. Uh, okay. If we were here 25 years ago, there's a lot of things we could change in history, but hey, we made the most. I think the point is we made the most of what we got and it turned out to be okay. And now we're gonna try to make um, our plant more efficient and effective than it was. So, so you talked about some of that reserve capacity that would be being developed. Are we able to handle such things as Northern Plains nitrogen if they were to have effluent to come in here? I think Northern Plains Nitrogen uh, Council is probably a little bit different. They just really need a large portion of our gray water or our wastewater effluent. I don't think they're going to, they would, their plan was not to return much to our wastewater treatment plant. I think the industries that we're um, discussing right now probably fit more. I'm going to exclude Northern Plains Nitrogen from that conversation. That's kind of a net benefit because they just take a lot of our wastewater, use it through their process, uh, and, you know, use a lot of it up. I think the plants, um, the agar business that we're talking about now are more akin to like J.R. Simplot, where they're going to be a large water user and a, a large uh, wastewater discharger to us. And so those are the um, economic development opportunities that we're looking at. So if those things happen, we're going to have to, um, as Sean talked about, we're going to have to add some of those features into this project while they design and construct construct their facility. So we're not building things for what may happen, but at, generally with industry, it takes two to three years. At the same time, working in parallel, we'll have to be making improvements in our wastewater treatment plant too, sooner rather than later. So, and last one, is, that, is Red River Biorefinery, is that kind of stabilized now, the effluent, so that we're sitting? Yeah, Council Vice President Mock and Council Member um, Vian, it has gotten better, yeah. I wouldn't say it's fully stabilized, but uh, it's gotten much better, and um, it's it's gotten better. We're treating it through our wastewater treatment plant. Mr. Kwame? Uh Mr. Phelan, I just got a citizen question regarding the Red River Valley bio refinery. How much of what they do is affecting this study, and what our potential costs will be right now, or is that more of the gap that we're planning for? Council Vice President Mock and Council Mayor Kalama. That's a very good question. I think what Red River Biorefiner did is they took a lot of our excess capacity, and so that's kind of where we're at right now. So they're they're paying our their fair share, and so you, when you look at, there were a large. I think they're about 800,000 gallons per day. So they took some of our hydraulic capacity, but more so of our treatment capacity, and probably more than what we had first anticipated. But it was good that we had, did have some surplus capacities, and so they've kind of pushed us to the point where we can't add a whole lot. We couldn't add another industry right now, um, and we really would limit our ability to treat, even from a residential and commercial growth. They just kind of took a lot of our capacity. And if you look at East Grand Forks plus Red River Biorefinery, we had a lot of surplus capacity that we had planned for that we never really got. But I would say over the last you know five, six years, we've used up a lot of that surplus capacity. Um, Mr. Phelan, I seem to remember, um, I thought we were waiting for the $30 million bond to roll off to do the biosolids improvements, and now it seems like that isn't until phase three. Is that something we can continue to 
to wait on? It seems like we've talked about that for quite a few years now. Uh, Council, Council Vice President Mock, yeah, we did talk about that. I think with all the advent of what kind of our, our bigger priority right now is our ability to treat the wastewater. And uh, I think that's why we're proposing, because there's only so much we can bite off at once, to push the solids um, off further. I think that's not an immediate issue. Our more immediate issue is our ability to treat wastewater um, if we have any, um, any substantial new users. I think that's our higher priority right now. Um, and is there, have we looked at or is there any savings if we would combine parts of one and three? Because um, it seemed like phase one was prepping so that we could put off phase three. Is there any potential savings to just do phase three? Council Vice President Mock, I think there'd always be savings, but I think it's so incremental to the larger cost. I think the larger cost is, is such a large cost to add biosolids in with this. So I think, you know, phase one is really to correct some of the hydraulic limitations in the plant. Um, that's at 13 million. And then the secondary is to refit those four reactors and make them operate more efficiently and effectively and treat the wastewater. So I think we need to combine those two right off the bat and that'll give us a, a more capacity than we need. And then I think as Sean said, if we do get a large industry that um, is, we can drop those additional treatment um, operations in, within those reactors, which I think is really smart. And, and, and we can, as we do that, if we get a new industry, certainly they're gonna pay for those, that additional capacity themselves, but at least we've set up the four reactors so that we can adapt more quickly. The biosolids is something I think we have to just monitor when, when the right time to do that. Right now, they're being treated where they're at, and I think we have more immediate needs. Further comments? Mr. President Bob? Yes, Mr. Weber. Um, Mr. Phelan, uh, thanks for the presentation. I, when we discuss something like the BMX uh, uh, bike track, that's really fun stuff to talk about. Uh, this is uh, uh, maybe not as much fun, but my, my, this is so important to the uh, the, the economic health, basic public health, and basic functioning of our city. Uh, I don't know if I just needed to hear it twice. I probably need to hear it more times, but um, I appreciate the additional information that you brought forward this evening. It's my understanding that you are looking for a, a motion to uh, adopt this plan and submit it to the, uh, ND, uh, D, the Department of Environmental Quality for review and approval. Is that right? We're looking for a motion? Yes, please. I'll, I'll, I'll move approval. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? Well, a second. And a second. Um, further comments or questions? Yes, Mr. Kavami. Just one further question. When adopting this plan, um, I'm assuming we're not locked into dollar amounts until a later point. Yep. We're yep. Just, just proving the plan, just kind of have a sense of what the dollar amounts you. are. And this is one of these projects where you're going to hear multiple times as we come back here. Um, on an annual basis, you're going to hear a lot about the wastewater treatment planning improvements. Thank you. Um, any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Item 2.9, Public Works Facility Renewal Project Number 8251, Fuel Depot and Generators Award Bid Agreement for Construction Administration Services and Associated Budget Amendments. Good evening. Good evening. The Public Works Department has been working on different types of renewal projects and one was um, in regard to the fuel depots. The current site actually has underground fuel tanks. Um, they've got a canopy that's in disrepair and then the concrete right around that site is heating and cracking. And so currently um, we get water that filtrates into that area where the underground fuel tanks are. We've had water in the fuel that has affected um, our emergency vehicles that have fueled up. And then we, it's labor intensive for us to take care of because we have to physically pump out the water with a sump pump and then manage that sometimes um, at all hours, depending upon when we have heavy rain events. So as we were talking about um, those needed improvements, we were also talking about how the fact that those facilities don't, the facility doesn't have generators. And this has been um, an item that we've discussed for quite a few years. In 2020, when we had um, predictions of fairly high levels of the Red River, we had talked about utilizing public works as an um, EOC or an operations center. Um, we don't have generation power there, so if we have trouble with um, weather events, et cetera, it, it makes it really difficult for our public works 
first responders to get in there and get out and even to utilize that space. It's, it's a nice large space. Um, so we talked about combining these projects to really benefit from the economies of scale. Talked about how it is um, improvement, I'm sorry, that materials have been increasing in price and that maybe now is the best time to go ahead with this. Although it wasn't included in the budget because so many things have happened um, with COVID in 2020 and planning into 2021, we just didn't include projects of, these size, of this size. Um, in discussions with finance, we are able to fund the project through fund 3448, um, and it's actually a 2009 funding improvement of the sanitation bond, which was refinanced. So there is cash available for this one-time improvement. Um, we did have a bid opening and received several bids. Uh, the general contract, or I'm sorry, the general bid was of Strata Corporation of 818,100. Mechanical was of Lunseth um, for 355,500. Electrical with Rick Electric at 533,000. We are look at, looking at warding the total bid as well as the alternatives. There was a few alternatives that were added to the project that just made sense while we were there. That was actually repairing the panels um, near the fuel depot. We are able to reuse the tanks and reuse the programming and software that we actually, card readers that we put into that system. But the concrete in that area needs to be repaired as well as, um, or as, well as a second alternative, which is helping with some of the issues that we have in a, where we do the street sweepers and we wash them out, making it more um, amenable to our stormwater MS4 permit. So some stormwater improvements there. And then the last one is just adding some barbed wire to the, to the fencing area near and around that um, new depot site. Um, so we are asking tonight to make a recommendation to council to award bidding the project, as, um, as I've mentioned, and then also the <coughs> approving of an associated budget amendment um, that will be subject to review and approval of the finance department. Thank you. Comments or questions? Yes, Mr. Fami. So I'm just looking at the bids and then these different forms. So what's the total project cost? The total project gets? cost is the 1.7. The 1.7. Yep. Okay. And that is over. I'm sorry. That's without the alternatives. Alternates. Nope. That's with the to alternatives. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Bean, did you have a question? Yeah. Just a quick question. I'm, I'm assuming. We had to follow North Dakota and have the three separate contractors, right? Correct. So there were there was there look did you look at combined bids and then the separate and this was the low bid then was with the three separate Correct. Um, is is with having the three separate, who takes the lead as far as managing the project when you have is the general contractor, is that included in the price here is his oversight of the other contractors and too is that included that is correct yep it would be strata's responsibility as a general contractor we didn't get any combined bids we just got three separate okay so i'd make a motion to approve the uh, staff recommendation we have a motion is there a second and a second um any further comments or questions oh yes mr Kavan. so um you know, in my world, we're seeing a lot of projects just hit pause because they're seeing bids like this, you know, 32% over the estimate um, just seems like a lot. You know, I'm not going to deny that this isn't something that we need, um, but, uh, you know, for a lot of stuff that I'm seeing, it's waiting a year. It's things are crazy right now. Um, did we strongly consider that? I, I just, 30% is a lot. And maybe that's not a question for you. <laughs> I think we did, and we did ask, EAPC is the engineer on this one, so we did ask that, and they thought uh, it was a competitive bid. You know, obviously we got two locals, and one brick electric is obviously out of Fargo-Moorhead. So we can certainly ask that question again, and that was one of the questions. What if we rebid this this winter for for next spring? Would we get a would we get a better bid at that point in time? So that's the initial answer. So, you know, this was open on Thursday, so we haven't had a lot of time to to work through but we um on your request council member Kovami, we will we can do some further due diligence and, and come back with some email you folks and provide some further information sure. and we you know we've been seeing 30 to 40 percent so they did an, i mean you can see that the all firms involved did an excellent job predicting it i think it's right where it should be it just pains me a little bit yeah. that's all 
Um, any further comments or questions? Yeah, Vice President Mock? Yes, Mr. Weber. Uh, if that's being reconsidered, can we also include uh, the cost of not acting this year if there's a, a weather event or, or just ongoing problems there? What, what might we anticipate the associated costs of not acting at this time? Thank you. Council Vice President Mock. Yes, I think, I think we did that. You know, one of our initial conversations with Public Works was, you know, can we just hold off? And um, we decided let's move forward the bid to see how they come in and we'll make some further contemplation. So that was one of our thoughts is to do that. But we'll, we'll take some further consideration of uh, both factors. Sure. Thanks. You know, yes, Mr. We could, obviously, we don't know what it's going to be like in, in three months, six months, where <laughs> prices can go up. Uh, they could come back down. Um, it seems to me like you've clearly identified the need for it. Um, and it would, uh, you know, I guess nobody knows, but at least we have this. Uh, it's the prices are fairly indicative of. Uh, it's, I'm glad to hear what you said. You've seen this on other projects too. Uh, it's a it's a worrisome trend. Uh, it doesn't seem to be, from what I can see, getting better soon. Uh, that's the only problem I have, and I think sometimes it's better to take what we have. I think, um, and that's why I made the motion to accept the. Bid, the recommendation any further comments seeing none all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. opposed same sign aye uh, motion carries five to one thank you um item three informational items 3.1 COVID update i think it's just there for your information council council okay. vice president um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved by Mr. Weigel. And a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. <laughs>